person may have many troubles. But the Lord delivers him from them all. Verse 20 says, he protects all his bones. And not one of them will be broken. That is going to be your testimony. No matter the trouble you find yourself. You should go with this confidence. That regardless of what that circumstance may be. Or whether it's hardship. No matter what the challenge is. God will deliver you from them all. So if you fall into 1,000 hardships, will God not say, ah, ah, only you? I will only save you from 700. The remaining 300, you're on your own. Does that God, do, I mean, does God do that to us? No. He said, I will deliver you from them all. All right, so let me try and share my story. At times, I think I've shared it so much <laughs> that I think everybody had had. But the more I share it, the more I discover that um, many people need to stay here. All right, I was born, I told you my age last Sunday, didn't I? Oh, no, I didn't. All right, so I was born um, in 1965. So this year, I'm going to be 54. All right. I said it last week. Now you clapped when I said it. I don't forget things. <laughs> All right. My problem in life started from the first day that I was born. My mother said um, immediately I was giving birth to um, a problem started. The medical people discovered that Immediately I came out from my mother's womb, my umbilical cord. You know, it's that cord that links the mother to, is it the placenta or whatever? Don't let me mother biology. I told you I had four F9 in it, so. <laughs> so it was knotted in three places. And so immediately I came out and the medical people saw that the umbilical cord was knotted in three places. Um, yes, that was the first joy that, ha, Ekwe Womo Abi. Then they now saw the problem, and then, so the challenge was, so how do they or not these three things? And, um, of course, after my mother told me, I had to go and check online. What happens when the umbilical cord is knotted even in one place? Of course, that's how oxygen passes, um, flowing to the child. And then, of course, if there is no oxygen flowing, the first place that gets affected is the brain. So there is a likelihood that the child will be born um, majorly um, as a, what is it, cerebral palsy. You know? But thank God, somehow they were able to unknot the three knots. And um, that was the first deliverance I got in life. But one of the questions that I kept on asking myself, those three knots had always been there right from the time I was in the womb. How did it happen that oxygen was not cut off from flowing to my brain? How did it happen that I was born and I was still normal? And you know one of the conclusions I came to, um, the my thoughts about the first challenge I had in life, from the very first minute I came into the world. The devil knows every one of us. Are you listening to me? And he knows our destiny. He knows what God has in stock for majority of us. And he's going to do everything that he can to stop it from coming to pass. So for somebody like me, I just, I just told myself, oh, maybe the devil knew that I'm destined for greatness in life. And he just needed to snuff out my life 
or make me miserable in life right from the first day. But thank God, the Lord delivered me from that one. And um, I was growing up. I was giving back to in Port Harcourt. No, I was giving back to my parents were in Port Harcourt when they got pregnant with me. And um, incidentally, that was when the civil war was um, about to happen in Nigeria in the second part of the 60s. And so, um, somehow, I could not uh, get the polio vaccine while I was in Port Harcourt. So my mother had to take me to Lagos. And um, I think it was almost like close to two years before I could get the polio vaccine. And um, I got the vaccine very well, quite all right. But some few days after that, my mother said that I just developed this high fever. And um, one day I was on the party. And um, before she came back, I'd fallen flat. And she thought I was actually playing because the whole thing was on top of me. And she was saying, get up from the floor. And she discovered I could not get up. And she pulled me up and I fell down again. And I told her, mommy, I can't walk. She said I said that because I can't remember. I had to sit her down to tell me the story of my life when I was young. And of course, that was how the problem started. Then they started running from pillar to post, taking me everywhere. She said um, we had a neighbor then that was more like um, a man that had to that knows how to do a lot of hot, I mean miracles with um, herbs. And he said, "I bring him. I know what to do." So they took me to that man. And um, he was doing what he knows how to do. And um, I think my mother would take me there in the morning, come back in the evening to pick me uh, while the man is applying everything he knows how to apply. And um, one of the mornings, maybe the third or fourth morning, as she was taking me there, the wife of that man said, Ma, you cannot enter our house again. I said, what happened? He said, this is your son. Cannot enter our house again. He said, <laughs> you know, every day I, I get um, improved version. Even after I'd written the book, I sat down with my mother. I said, tell me this story again. She said, what did she did not tell me when I was writing the book? She said, the man said, Anwaye came to him overnight and said, so who told you to treat that boy? and they decided to discipline him. So by morning, the man was covered with missiles from head to toe. And so the wife was shouting, the man was shouting, don't let him enter again, no. And so, um, my grandmother in Abeokuta, my mother is actually from Abeokuta. That's one of the attachments to Abeokuta. She said, bring him to Abeokuta. We know how to handle things like this. So they took me to Abeokuta. And the first man that was going to say, let me handle his case, happened to be an affair. He knows how to do one, two very well. Some people are sleeping. My story is not sweet. <laughs> Don't sleep, oh. Yes, I will feel so I'm telling stories to sleeping people. So the man was an afar. And also at least you say you hear your basmo. And the man was treating me. And um, one of those days, somehow, nobody knew what happened to that affair. Like they were saying, Yoruba, he just jumped up and down and he died. He said, ah. Then they said, no, all of Atala are the ones that we handle this one. So they carried me from 
afar. They took me to the Obatala place. And that one said, we know how to handle this type. So my mother said, he mentioned the day. When that went the authors, I can't remember again. Said there is a concussion I'm going to eat that day. That after that concussion, he's so sure this one will be resolved. I think it was Thursday. The Obatala priest died on Wednesday. Uh -huh. So <laughs> at first it was as if it was normal sickness that everybody falls sick. But when it started happening like that, it became obvious that there must be something with this person's life. And I'm waiting to even discover it also, you know. Well, to cut the long story short, eventually they took me to another, um, they call them native doctors. That one was in one forest somewhere. That one, you know, I was growing, as the more they were carrying me around, I was growing up. I knew, at least I was around three years old when I got to that, um, the native doctor in the forest. At least I can still remember faintly. I could see some ladies, they were painted in white, dotted white all over. They were half naked. They were dancing around something. I know I was there, you know. Well, I don't know what that one succeeded in doing, but he succeeded a little. Before I got to him, the two legs were gone. The only way I moved around was to crawl on my chest and move around, you know. So somehow, maybe he was able to overcome some of the ideas. So one of the legs started walking again, and that's the right leg. The left leg um, is still paralyzed up to date. Of course, growing up for me, to me was not a big challenge because I felt I was young. So at least I could move around even though not the way everybody was moving around. So I didn't see it as a big problem until maybe I was eight years old. And um, we grew up in Lagos. So we go to our village only once um, in the year. And that's always during Christmas. So. Um, we went for Christmas that year, and um, at the village, the Christmas of that year happened to coincide with the uh, masquerade festival of the village. And um, it wasn't a problem to me. But one day we, myself, I think two of my siblings, some of my cousins, one of my uncles, we just um, all said, all right, let's go around the village. Let's visit some uncles. Let's just play around. So we all left um, our family compound, and we were going around the village. When we almost got to the market square, the village, we had this drumming. And immediately the drumming was getting louder, Everybody started running elder skelter. And then we asked, so what is it? And they said, they mentioned that masquerade. They said it's coming out. And it's not supposed to meet anybody on the road. And so everybody was running for their, di their lives. And before I knew it, everybody we left my family compound together. Every other, everybody, every other person also took to their heels. Then I was supposed to run also from this masquerade. Then there was trouble. I wanted to run. I actually was running. But there are runnings and there are runnings. 
you know. They were running fast. I was hopping on one leg, trying to move. And I discovered I wasn't moving fast enough. And then the drumming was getting louder. And of course, I started screaming. I started crying. I started shouting and begging everybody. We left my family compound together. Wait for me. Somebody help me. And um, I discovered that it was a matter of every man for himself. God for all, us all. Everybody just took off. In fact, I can still see some of the imagery in my head. I was seeing them from afar, running for their lives. But here was I trying to run. And, um, you know, I started crying. At a point, I was silly, feeling sad. I was feeling that pity for myself. That, ha, ah, if not for my leg, I should have been able to run. Now the masquerade is going to catch up with me. Ha, ah, hey. But you see, at a point in the middle of all these things, I just discovered that something just came over me that I could not explain up to today. I just stopped crying. And I told myself, all right, so this is the way life really is. When you think you need people most, they will take off. So life is all about every man for himself, God for us all. So this is the way people will always leave you to grapple with your life all alone. Please let me wake him. And he's sitting in front, so it's not convenient for him to sleep. Follow me in the, in the physical instead of in the spirit, bro. Talk is in the eyes. Oh. Open your eyes and be looking at me. That's the way Yoruba say. Okay. <laughs> you know, so I just told myself this is the way life is. Everybody will always leave you to sort yourself out by yourself. Bro, you're on your own. That was the way I felt that day. And right there and then I started making up my mind. I said, I can't afford to be weak in life. I can't afford to pity myself because of my condition. I can't afford to always find myself in situations when I would always be at the mercy of other people. And what is happening now is what will always happen to me. Are you following me? So that day I just told myself, I'm not going to trust nobody again. I'm not going to rely on anybody in life again. I'm not going to go through life thinking somebody will help me again. And so I was still trying to escape from the masquerade. At a point, one of my, one of my I call him my uncle, but he's just a year older than me. Maybe he just realized that I was really far back. So he ran all the way back and um, he said, Kola, jump on my back. I jumped on his back quite all right. Then I started crying again because I felt, oh, all right. So this is the right time for you to come back. <laughs> so if the masquerade has caught up with me, all of you will be looking from afar and say, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. You know, I felt no. When people will come for you, they will come at the wrong time. I'm not going to trust nobody no more. And that was how I moved on with my life. So from that point on, I became another person. I wasn't born again yet, but I became another person that when I'm hot, you will never see it on my face. The only person that knew me well was my mother then. When she sees me smiling so much, she will say, Kola, come. What's wrong with you? Are some of you like me? Because if I show weakness on my face, you can't help me. 
If I tell you what I'm going through, you will take off the way they took off. So let me, let me just go through life on my own. Why should I show you that I'm weak? Why should I show you that I'm troubled? Why should I show you that I'm bothered? And that was how I was growing up. I just became, I just became somebody like that. And then the next thing that I discovered started happening to me was that I discovered that for long, I've allowed that leg or this leg is still with me. I said that leg as if it's at home. <laughs> I allowed this leg to define my life. When I come out, the first thing people will see is say, hey, yeah, but eh? And somehow you enjoy it. And I say, you leg, you're not going to define my life. No, no more. And so, anytime they want to do anything that is going to require maybe strength or you being on your two legs, the first person they rule out is who? It's always me. And say, ah, no, Kola cannot do these type of things. But I will always tell you, no. I'm actually going to be the first to do it. So I, I just developed this can-do spirit. I just developed this fighting spirit. I just developed this spirit that will not accept no for an answer. I just felt, no, it's not going to happen that way. You know, so I'm not, at the point my father started teaching my siblings how to drive. And um, I'm not sure I told you I have a lot of siblings. Actually, I have eight siblings. So we are nine. I'm the third. Eight of these nine are guys. The last one is the only girl. All right, you can understand. So in a house of many guys, and every guy always wants to learn how to drive heli. So my father was teaching everybody how to drive. I remember that day we went to our village. And then he had a farm. And he was teaching everybody how to drive. And I said, that is my turn. I said, Kola Wale, you cannot drive this type of car. So when you grow up, you will buy an automatic car. That is the one you will buy. You will drive. So anytime anybody tells me you cannot do this, I don't argue with you. I will just smile. I looked at that car. I said, you car, I will drive you. So, of course, I made a bargain with uh, my father's driver. The first day, I think I mentioned it last week, the first day that um, Owade, that's the name of my father's driver, Owade, I said, Owade, give me this car. I said, Akola, you can't drive. I said, who told you I can't drive? Give me the car, Joe. So he said, okay, come and try. So it took me, of course, all that while I was observing how my other siblings were driving. So each time we go out, Instead of me looking at the road, I'm looking at their legs. I'm looking how they touch the, the gear. I'm looking how they turn the steering. So there was one day, myself and my immediate elder brother, we went somewhere. We wanted to gist. So it took a path. And that path, of course, there was no other car coming. So he left the car in gear one. It wasn't present anything. So that car was just going by itself. So that day I said, okay. So when Owade said, you can't drive, I told him, let's go to this road. So when we got to that road, I just did it exactly the way Tunji did it. That's my brother's name. I just put the car in GR1. That's not a problem. Of course, before that time, I've been moving it front and back. Where daddy parks it in front of the house. I'll move it. I'll move it. I said, okay, I can move it. I can move it. So when we got to that road, Owadi sat on the other side and I just left it in Jawan and it was just going on its own. I say, she said I can drive. <laughs> ah, I didn't, ah, you can drive. He didn't know that um, 
I only did what I saw somebody. That was how he said, yeah, she will get down. Or why did I got down? <sighs> so I moved the car away from that lonely path. And I joined the main road. For the first time in my life. I, and I was reading books. Oh. I wasn't always just saying I will do it. I was reading books. In one of the books, I read that when you want to um, change the gear, you must increase speed. So, increase speed. I never knew that when you increase speed, I just think, press the turtle. And then, so I was just pressing the turtle. The thing will go, oh, I will change the gear. Ah, I was sweating. Meanwhile, what has gotten down? I said, today, ah, I thought it's this easy. While I was experimenting how to move the car, he got to a railway line. And that was how the car just parked itself there. <laughs> the car, it was in GF3. I wanted to move, and then the car just jumped to the front, and then it just went off again. I was not smart enough to know that I was supposed to change, change the gear. In fact, something that will not allow me to know what to do next happened. Then the train was coming. And immediately the train saw a car on the rail. It started hooting the arm from far. And this was me. I said, ah, Babolubo, this car. Babolubo, this car. How will I tell him? So I will start the car again. It will jump to the front. It will jump back. I said, ah, I'm in trouble today. By that time, people have gathered. Jump down. Oh, they're bustling. Hey, ah. People were already putting their head, hands on their head. You know, women were already dancing. Hey, 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 hey. You know. <laughs> then the dream was getting so close. I will start the car again. I will try to move it. We jump back. And then when it was almost close, something. How many of us always say something told me? Uh -huh. Something just told me that that car is in GR3. It will keep jumping up and down, front and back, if you don't change it back to GR1. So even before I started the car, if some of you that have driven manual cars before, I changed it to GR1. Then I pressed, uh, I need to tell you how, how I, I was driving that car. I will tell you later. <laughs> you know, so I pressed the clutch, then I pressed the turtle, then I just started the car, and then I removed my leg from the clutch, and then it just jumped off the rail. <laughs> As it just jumping, that same moment, the train just went. Phew. And then I stopped the car, and people were shouting, Hey, uh, oh, guy. The only thing I knew I was do doing was I was shaking. By that time, I was there at the rant of where we were. So I called, oh, there's no more, wow. Oh, there's no more, wow. <laughs> In fact, I wasn't hearing anything anybody was saying. Before we got home, the news had gotten home. <laughs> you know those type of things. <laughs> but you see I was too much in a shock to even hear whatsoever daddy and mommy were saying I didn't hear anything they said that day I was still shaking that night I got to the bed I thought it was easy I got to the bed I could not sleep, sleep. the whole bed was <laughs> and that was how it was and that day, I, I vowed and promised myself, in my life, I will never drive again. Ha! <laughs> ah, I almost died. I will never try to drive again. You know, so it was like that. Until quite a while, and they sent myself on a, I mean, a wadi on the, an inherent. And after we had finished on our way back, or oh, they just parked. He got down. Say, Kola, 
come and drive. I said, what day? I am not driving. He said, Kola, he said, he's a Yoruba guy. He said, Kola, in two children, you have called Shele new. Could they live more? Could they need more? You know, he just encouraged me. And then I sat behind the steering again. Then the whole memory of the train just came back. And I heard the steering like this. And my hands started shaking all over again. He said, Kola Farabale. Kola Farabale. I was moving and the car was going like this. And after that first day of shaking, then anytime they send us on errand, or what day we always get down. I say, Kola, you know, they had to come up with my, he was teaching me how he knows how to drive. But I discovered that I can't drive the way he is driving because he has his two legs intact. I have only the right leg intact. The left leg was gone. You understand? So each time I want to press the clutch, it was always a problem. So I had to devise my own way. How do I press a clutch that is always hard and um, it will go down? So I had to devise a way of using my left hand to press my left leg to comp I mean to press the clutch. So if I'm on motion, I need to change the gear. So the left hand was always on the left leg, working on the clutch. So I would need to quickly use the right hand to change the gear. And so the only the right hand was always on the steering. And that was how I knew how to drive. If I had a point, there was nobody that was driving as much as I was doing in that family. And I made sure it was that my father's car. In fact, I so much fell in love with that car that when I got married, <laughs> I inherit, inherited that car along with my marriage, even before my father died. Is, are you listening to me? I discovered that my Kandu spirit was pushing me. All right, I told you so much about um, my academics and how I got to university last week, so I won't go back to that. But I made a vow to God. Can I get water from this, your new... Um, yes, we dedicated it last week, so let me drink from it. The water must be anointed. All right. I made a vow to God that if you will allow me to make it to the university, that I will give my life to him. I think I said that last week. I thought you, I thought you want this, so I want the dispensing machine. <laughs> All right. And so the Lord made it happen that in 1984, um, I got admitted to Obafemi Aulo University. And so I needed to fulfill my own side of the vow. So the, that very year, I think I resumed, thank you very much. I resumed in November. I gave my life to him in December. Please. All right. So when I got to, I resumed November, the Christmas Eve of um, that year, no, just leave it. I don't want all of them to disturb me. The December of that year, 1984, the Christmas Eve, I told you of my younger brother that entered the university before me. He was the one that invited me to the fellowship that day. And I followed him. And when we got to the fellowship, not as if they had not preached to me before, but I also had my grudge against God. Because I felt, so where was God when all the things I was going through were happening to me? So I had that side of the grudge with God. But of course, as I was growing up, I knew that I can't keep fighting God. 
So if anybody is here also that is fighting God, it's time that you, you end your fight with him. That day I gave my life to Jesus. And I thought being born again is just, just believe that Jesus is in you. Just believe that you are born again. And then I will become a religious person that is reading Bible and going to church and um, going to fellowship. But I discovered in my life that being born again was much more than that. I discovered that being born again was entering into a relationship with my maker. Are you with me? I discovered that being born again it was almost like my life was starting afresh. And one of the things that I'm somebody that when I make up my mind to do something, I give myself into it. So when I got born again, I really wanted to know God. I really wanted to know more of him. And in the fellowship, I will hear people say, and God told me this. And God said, and God said I should do this. And then my curiosity was that, oh, so God speaks. How do they hear? When will God start speaking to me also? So I was really, really, really hungry to know God. I was really hungry to experience him. I wanted him to speak to me also. Then along the line, I would see people doing deliverance. I say, and then they are casting out the money in the name of the Lord Jesus. I say, ah, ah, they can do this one also. I say, so me too, I should be able to do it. You know? I won't go so much along that line because the journey is still far. But one thing that happened is that the more I was seeking after God, the more God started revealing himself to me. And I was in a meeting one day. I think it was a prayer meeting. And we were all praying and everything. Suddenly, I just had something. Tell me something. He just told me something. I've forgotten what the person that was ministering that day said. I think he was saying something about the anointing. And I just had inside of me. Be careful how you ask for the anointing. For the anointing can kill. I said, hey, me, which, which kind of thought is this one? No, you know? And I was supposed to tell the people. I said, me, I'm not saying any of this thing, no. Now they will tell me, how did I know? And I'll say, I just felt and I, something told me. And I was fighting with it. I said, ah, how can anointing key? Ah, me, I don't know this thing, no. As I was struggling with it, somebody just got and said, Thus hear the Lord. God said I should tell us that be careful how you ask for the anointing. For the anointing can kill. I said, huh? I had it. That was the first day that it occurred to me that God had started speaking to me. So I can hear the voice of God. That was the first day that I just don't know me that ha. Huh? So this thing that they say God speaks, I'm already hearing God. And you see, when you start, it's always so sweet. I want to hear more. I want to know more. I want to see more. And before I knew it, God started revealing himself to me so much. So much to the point, you know, growing up. In those days, you are watching the film of Spider-Man and Superman. We were reading the comics. Late 60s, early 70s. So when I got born again and all those things started happening, I said, Kai, I've become a superhero. You know, I just, <laughs> that was the way I was seeing myself. And I was really, after those tough, tough things, casting out demons and everything. And um, maybe the areas where I enjoyed the presence of the Holy Spirit most was in my academics. I remember the day we had a test that course advanced statistics. 
the more you read that course, the less you understand. In fact, the more you struggle to read, the more of it that begins to go. So naturally, I knew I was going to fail the, the, this course. And then we had the test. And I said, Holy Spirit, you must help me. You must help me. And we got to the test, to the examination hall. And I looked at the question. Sincerely speaking, it sounded like Greek. I read it again and said, ah, ah, what question is it? And then I said, Holy Spirit, I know you can help me. Help me. Suddenly, I started hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. He said, start writing. And the Holy Spirit was telling me what to write. And as he was saying it, I was writing. And I was writing, I was laughing. Because I did not understand what I was writing. And I would get to a point and say, sir, I don't know what to write again. Say, write this one. And then I will start writing. And it's statistics. One beautiful thing with statistics is that no matter how you do it, you always get an answer. Even if you change variable Y, and exchange it for variable X, you will always get an answer. I was getting answers. But I didn't know I was getting answers and I was laughing. When I finished that test, everybody was saying, ah, hole, ah, shake. I was laughing because I knew that <laughs> I went to an examination hall and I started writing what I didn't know. So when it was time for the lecturer to give us our script back, the man came and he started lashing at everybody in the class. Say, you are all this, you are all that. I have taught you. You don't know nothing. You don't know this. You don't know that. You all failed. You all did woefully. Ah, da, da, da. He said, except for Alex. They call me Alex in the university. He said, for, except for Alex. And he said, I said, eh? Hey, hey, me? He said, yes. He said, Alex used a formula I didn't teach you in class. And I looked at his script. I was looking for where I'm going to mark him wrong. And I could not. I gave him 40-40. I said, okay. Then suddenly I became a superhero. I said, okay. Maybe I should not have been happy so soon. So the man said, because you all failed. You have been the exam again now. So I'm redeeming that, that one to 20. And so reduce the first one to 20. Say, start. Immediately he says, start. I said, all right. <laughs> I looked at that thing again. It was a Greek thing. But before, if you had told me we were doing it again, I would have begged the Holy Spirit. But pride came in. Because he said I was the only one that passed. So pride was already reigning. Before he said, you are doing the exam. So before I could clear my pride out, I said, Holy Spirit, I humble myself. Come and teach me again. It was too late. I looked at the question. I could not answer it. I just turned the paper. And I put my head on the table. I said, well, I can't kill myself today. The man came back and said, Alex, have you finished? I said, sir, I don't know what to write. He said, use the formula you used the other time. I said, sir, I can't remember that formula. <laughs> Are you listening to me? It's so beautiful when you have a relationship with God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit, when it comes upon you, it will be in you, it will be with you. It will guide you to all, into all truth. It will pick of what is God and it will reveal to you. I so much enjoyed it. I didn't bargain for it when I gave my life to Jesus. I thought... It's all about being religious. But I never knew I'd entered into something that was going to affect the whole of my life up to now. Are you with me? Please, if you're a child of God here, and I believe you are, don't just be satisfied being born again alone. Are you listening to me? The desire of God. He said, I will be your God. And you will be my people. 
The desire of God is to make himself known unto you. You know, it's just like the children of Israel. When they came out of Egypt, the desire of God was to introduce himself to all of them. But the day that God came down on the mountain to introduce himself to them, and God, of course, they saw the smoke land on the mountain, and they heard the voice of God. What did they all do? You've not run the, read the Bible to that point. The Bible said they all ran. They ran away from God. When the reality of God started dawning on them, they ran. And then they were looking at God from afar. Then they thought they were doing Moses a favor. They said, Moses, shall you are the one that has been telling us that God said, God said, eh, you, go and meet that God. Let him be saying to you, and whatever he tells you, come and be telling us. And you see, that's the way some of us still relate with God. You have third party relationship with God. You will prefer somebody else to go and hear from God and come and tell you. Say, ah, so it's God that said it. Eh? So we'll do it. So even if the person came to tell you lies, you don't even have a relationship with your father. So you just swallow everything, hook, line, and sinker. You must have a relationship with God. Are you listening to me? Don't be satisfied with just being born again. Don't tell yourself and feel good that at least I come to church every Sunday and I come to midweek services. No, you are not doing anybody a favor like that. No, you are not. You must grow. And listen to me, you must grow. You must be interested in spiritual things. I grew so fast. Within a year or two of my getting born again, I was already doing what people that have been in Christ in six years were already doing. That was a day they were having a program. And they told some people, um, if you want Holy Ghost baptism, come out. And I was one of the people that was supposed to minister. And so the person I was supposed to minister to, I said, are you born again, sir? said, I'm born again. said, when did you get born again? said, 10 years ago. I said, and you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? He said, no. Me that was talking to him, I was just one year old in the Lord. I said, you're going to receive him now. I'm going to lay my hands on you. Are you going to receive him? And I laid my hands on this man that had been born again for 10 years. And almost immediately, he just started. And he was rolling on the floor. Then I started crying. I started crying because I did not appreciate the grace of God that had been upon my life. I never appreciated what God was doing. And listen to me. I, um, let me tell you one or two more stories. And then I can round off. Okay, when it was time for me to, I knew it was, it was about time for me to round off my program on the campus. And some of us did not get to campus um, as a young person. I left the campus age 23. My son is living at age 19 or 20. All right. So those days, by the time you leave campus, you're already thinking, um, in fact, we have a song. When you get to part four of 100 level in the university and you are still single, we have a song we normally sing. Shall I go empty handed? Shall I be my. <laughs> so when we are praying and we are singing that song, you think you are spiritual. Ah, shall I meet my Savior? No. God, am I leaving this campus empty-handed? So you bring down your voice and begin to talk to God. God. So I started praying in my part four. God, I don't want to go empty-handed. Then there was this sister. <laughs> you know this sister, ni? the way you all said, mm. The first day I was going to meet the sister. That's why you should be spiritual. You understand? Then I was going to meet the sister. 
um, it was another sister that said, I have a, a sister that I'm following up. And she needs Holy Ghost baptism. Please come and help me minister Holy Ghost baptism to her. I said, ah, why not? <laughs> now, I minister Holy Ghost baptism to a lot of people, so it wasn't a problem for me. So, when it was the turn of this sister, of course, I ministered Holy Ghost baptism to her. I laid hands on her and say, speak in Jesus' name. And then she started speaking in tongues. And she still speaks it up to now. She started speaking in tongues. And um, to me, it's just another assignment. And I just went. But to that sister, she felt, ha, ah, this is a spiritual brother. Maybe if one makes him, um, we call him spiritual father or whatever, then he will help me know the Lord. And so she became my friend. And then I adopted her as my daughter in the Lord. You know. All right. Ah, so you can all be lively like this. <laughs> So when I started praying, God, shall I go and empty handed? It just occurred to me that it's this sister that has been coming to my heart. She's daughter, you know. So it became so difficult for me to go and tell daughter and say, daughter, um, status is about to change. But we became very close friends. Apart from being daughters, we became very close friends. She had a lot of issues at home. That um, God in his mercy just gave me the wisdom to know what to do. And it was, it was working. You know. When those ones were happening, there was no string attached. It was later that the string just surfaced. And attached itself. You know. Because we have been friends, we've been friends for like two years. When I was going to leave the campus, we've been friends for like two years. And um, it just occurred to me that I needed to tell her. And the day I was going to propose to her, and um, I started by saying, I've been praying, I've been thinking, I've been hoping. I've been wishing. I didn't hard fast. That you'll be my future partner. I'm teaching you how to proposal. Brothers, don't go there and say, and I saw an angel. I say, my son. Sister, when anybody say, I saw an angel, say thank you. When I see the angel also, I'll give you your response. No, don't bamboozle people like that. All right, because we had been friends, I thought it was going to be an easy journey. I was expecting an easy no. I mean, an easy yet. Yes, rather. But unfortunately, I got a no. And I said, of course, that date was not funny. It wasn't funny for me. It wasn't funny for her. You know, when father is proposing to daughter, it wasn't that straight. And immediately I said it, of course, daughter started crying. She cried because she was disappointed. How can this man that I have trusted now come to this? And apart from that, ah, sisters, they've been telling her. Say, this is your brocade. She calls me brocade. They all call me brocade on the campus then. Say, this is your brocade, brocade. Hey, one day. And she has been telling them that, no, brocade is not like those other brothers. Brocade is, is spiritual. As a spiritual brother, we know one day marry. All right, so I got a no. And. Um, I didn't want to hurt her, so I left it like that. And that was um, 
my last few days on the campus. So my last week on the campus, um, of course, we've all finished the exam. She too had finished her exams. Of course, we continued as father-daughter, you know, since we can't go there that way again. So when she was going home, um, at the end of the session, of course, she came to my room to say, ah, I'm going home. And um, Habakkuk happened to be home. So as she was stepping out, and I was seeing her off, I started asking God questions. I said, God, I thought you said that Tony is the one that is going to be my wife. Now I proposed, and she said no. I was seeing her off. Oh, I wasn't on my knees. Oh. I was seeing her off. And I was dialoguing with God in my heart. And God said, yes. She's going to be your wife. But God, she said, no. God said, she's eventually going to be your wife. I said, oh God. God said, three things are going to happen to you. I think I mentioned it last week. He said, to prove that because I was telling God, I'm not likely to see her again. Then, home for us was in Oshogbo. We moved where my father retired from CBN. We moved from Lagos and we moved to Oshogbo. So Oshogbo was home for me. Abekuta was home for her. So God said, so I was telling God, God, she's going to Abekuta. I don't have any reason to, see, to go to Abekuta. I'm not likely to see her again. God said, you will see her. He said, three things are going to happen to you. When you leave the campus, you're serving in Ogun State, and you'll be posted to Abeokuta. You are working in Abeokuta. You will get married to her in Abeokuta. I think I mentioned those three things last week, but I didn't tell you the genesis that led to that revelation. Okay, that's the genesis. And um, so it was time for God to prove himself. And when my call-up letter came out, I was posted to Cross River State. I said, all right, God. I thought you said Ogun State. And so when I got home, and in my fellowship then, unlike now, <laughs> they said, anywhere God posts you, that's where you should go. That's where God wants you to go and walk. So when I got home, I told my parents, I'm posted to Cross River State, and I'm going. Come and see my father and mother. They said, no. How can they post you there? You are not supposed to go. Then they tell you, they'll tell them you have this um, handicap. Then they, meanwhile, I deliberately, I was the one that caused it. I wanted to see whether what God said was going to come to pass. There was a form I was supposed to fill in my department to tell them I have disability. So if I had said that, they would have posted me to where I wanted. And that would have been easy. You understand? So I didn't, I did, let, deliberately didn't fill that form. So my father said no. So we had to go together to NYC head office in Lagos. And my father was raking for them. How can you post my son? Da, 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 da. No, 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 no. Nobody will help him in cross river. He is this, he is that. All I was doing, I just stood aside. The only thing I was waiting for I was observing how what God said was going to come to pass. So my father said, ah, we are in Osho State. And we are from Osho State. Post my son to Osho State. And those ones are apologizing to my father. And then they brought the record of Osho State. They said, Daddy, please, sir. Osho State is full. We can't post into Osho State. The only available state that is close by is Ogun State. Sir, we are very sorry. My father has been raking. Immediately they said Ogun State. He said Ogun State. Ah, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's my wife's, that's my wife's town. And my wife's uh, state. And my wife is from Abeokuta. You know? Say, so, yes, that is okay. We have people in Abeokuta. And that was how, without me saying one thing, the crossover thing was changed to Ogun State. 
And so that was how I ended up in Ogun State. Of course, I ended up in Abeokuta. And um, when I found myself in Abeokuta, I said, ah, the word of God is true. God is faithful. Let God be true and every other man be liars. So I said, this my daughters did not see it well. So I went to tell her again and said, the thing we said the first time, are you sure you've considered it well? And uh, she said, I've considered it. So she said, my answer is still no. The second thing God said was going to happen was that I was going to walk in Abiyokuta. So when I was retained, I said, hey, God is doing his own. Is this sister doing that is not seeing what God is doing? You know, that was like a year after. So I went back to her. I said, that our matter. So I still got to know. So when I started walking, a year after, I went back again. I said, hey, consider this our matter. She said, no. You know, and um, that was when the bank thing happened. And then I had to move out of Oshobo. Abi Okuta to Oshobo. I told you about that last week now. Abi, all right. So, of course, when I moved out of Abi Okuta and um, moved out of the will of God, I felt, all right, uh, since it's not happening in Abi Okuta, maybe I can look elsewhere. I looked elsewhere. All of the other sisters too were saying no. You know, you whistled. The first sister. If I that one... The way I prophesied, I mean, the way I proposed, proposed to her, it came with a prophecy. <laughs> ah, despite the powerful revelation that followed it, I got to know. The second sister, no. The third sister, no. You know? And, um, <laughs> ah, no, what happened? I've missed the place. I've, I've missed, no. I've not moved to Shogo then. I've not moved to Shogo. But it was, the years were counting. I left the campus um, 1988. So in 1991, you know, I kept on praying. So after everybody was saying no, 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 then I was praying to God as touching another sister. By that time, I'd forgotten about um, sister Toyin. I was praying about another sister. That sister was calling in, um, in Ondo. So I was praying about her seriously. Then one Saturday, I just I said, God, if Saul have refused to be a correct king, hey, bring David. David can be a better king. God, ah, give me another David. And I was praying. And I was praying and searching this other sister. I said, God, if you will give me a go ahead, I will go and propose to her today. Then I was still in Abeokuta. And suddenly as I was praying, I just heard God say, go. I said, God, are you saying it's okay to go and propose to this sister? I will mention her name. God said, go. I wasn't planning it before. It was around 11 a.m. in the morning when I was praying. I just carried my, just dressed up, and then I faced Ondo to go and propose to this wonderful sister. I got to Ondo around 5, around 4, 5. As I got to the gate of our school, I knew something was wrong. So I asked the security guys, I said, there's something, somebody I want to come and see inside. They said, ah, there's no student in the campus again. I said, what happened? They said, there was a riot yesterday. The students just, um, they just decided to go on rampage yesterday. So the school authority has closed down the school and every student has been sent home. I said, no, there's one student that is still left. <laughs> ah. God said I should come. You are saying all the students have left. One student is left. Ah, they say, and everybody had left. I said, can I go and check? 
You know those ones were looking at me as a madman and said, eh, hey, hey, eh, go. Of course, I knew her room and I was going. And lo and behold, there was no man there. Everybody had been sent home. Then I walked back to the gate and I was confused. How can God say, go? When God knew there was riot yesterday and there was no student on the campus today and he said, go. I thought I had God. Of course, I was confused. The time was going to around 6, then 5, after 5. So I was saying, I can't go back to Abeokuta today. My parents were still in Oshobo. Should I go to Oshobo? What should I do? So at the, at the end of the day, I agreed, I settled to go to Oshobo. I know that we asked me, where are you coming from? Um, long story. I settled for Oshobo. For you to get to Oshobo, you will pick, you will need to get to Ife. Then you pick a bus from Ife to Oshobo. So when I got, and then of course, the, you will pick the bus in front of the campus. So as I got in front of the campus, I said, ah, great Ife. I said, ah. Then I had a younger brother. One of my younger brothers was on the campus then. I said, ah, let me go and see Tommy. After all, it was on I came. And I didn't see what I came for. Let me go and greet my younger brother. Then I will face Oshobo. You know. So after seeing Tommy, I spent like five, ten minutes with him. And he was seeing me off. As we got to the corridor of his hall, he said, ah. Everybody calls me Broke. Say, ah, Broke. Sister Toyin's wing is on this side. Say, ah, floor Sister Toyin the real. Now everybody knew Sister Toyin in my house. You know? I say, hey, ah, okay. And I have no time more. So I say, all right, let me just quickly say hi to her. After all, we are still friends. So I just, um, she took, it took me to her room. Why am I even telling you this story now? <laughs> I was supposed to tell you other stories. Okay. She took me, it took me to her room and I was greeting her and um, Satoyin said, ah, it's God that brought you. She was working on her project, her final year project. So she got to the statistical side and she had issues. She said she has been praying that God, please bring somebody that can help me. And I said, ah, but I'm in a hurry. Because, and I was a statistician, you know. I said, ah, but I'm already late for Oshobo. Eh, oh, okay, let me just quickly put you through in 10 minutes. So I started, um, uh, you will use uh, Chasqua, and then you will do this, you will do this, you will do that. I looked at her face. I discovered that I've confused her the more. I said, in fact, <laughs> I looked at the clock. I said, and I can sleep in Ifeo. Of course, I had Tommy's room there. I had a lot of other friends. I said, okay. After all, even the Oshoba I was going before was not my primary destination. I said, okay, all right. I will stay on the campus. Let me teach you. And then, of course, she went to say, since you are staying, have you eaten since morning? And then I remember that I've not even eaten. So, so she went to do rice. And while the rice was doing itself, I was teaching her statistics. No. It was just statistics. Oh, uh, listen. <laughs> But while we are doing the statistics, another statistics just entered inside the statistics. <laughs> no, I didn't hear that song. Sing it again. You know, it just dawned on me that God in quote, tricked me. Sincerely speaking. Because by that time, the third time that I proposed to her, 
that was the third year. I was proposing to Sister Toyin every year <laughs> for three years. So the third year I proposed, she said, Broke, if you keep coming back like this, it will affect our friendship. So you need to pick one. So I said, okay, I cherish the friendship. I won't come back. So I promised her I was not going to propose again. So when we were doing statistics, it just occurred to me that it wasn't to undo that God was leading me. He actually wanted me to come to Ife. But if God had said, you are going to Ife, I would have given him the reasons why it cannot be the sister in Ife. You understand? So while I was doing statistics, the whole thing came. I didn't propose, oh, but now I understood why the journey went like this and then ended here. So we finished statistics that night and then we left. Now, of course, um, later when we, were, when we were comparing notes, Sister Twain said that day was the first time it was going to dawn on her that this is the man you will marry. This is the story I didn't want to tell you. I didn't know this is the one you want to hear. <laughs> All right. So I didn't propose to her that, that, that day. I went back to God and went to tell, I told God the reasons why it's going to be difficult. Listen, listen, listen. I told God the reason why it's going to be difficult for me. When am I stopping, sir? <laughs> eh? All right. You know, I went back to God and I said, okay, God, I know what you are, what you are planning. But it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. We have agreed. We have agreed that I am not coming back. You know? And God kept on urging me to go ahead. But I kept telling God, no, Lord. Then one day I was in the bedroom in Abe Okuta. And I had... Listen now. Learn to add the... The two together, you had spirituality to the whole thing. You know, I was in the bedroom that day, and suddenly, for the first time in my life, I had a audible voice. You know, when God speaks to you, He speaks to you in several ways. One of it is audible voice. The other one is when you have, hear that um, true intuition, intuitive thing. You just hear that voice within you. I just had a voice saying. And I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I had to say, Talo and Ben, because it was so loud. Say, and I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I had to open the door. I was the only one at home. Then the voice that I had outside, and I had inside, and I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And then I said, So, what heavenly vision? And suddenly, Holy Spirit started breaking it. God is telling you what to do. You are telling God, not so, Lord. So I said, all right, God, if it is you, I will go this last time. And that was going to be the fourth time. That was going to be the fourth year. So this time around, I was not bold enough to go and face her. So I decided to write. And some of us don't know how to write one page letter. I discovered that each time I write letters as I was growing up, I don't write one page, I don't write two pages. If I'm going to write you at least three, four, five. So most times I write novels when I write letters to you. You must read it again and again. And again. So when I was going to write her, full scalp, sheets, six pages, was my proposal. 
because now I needed to explain a lot of things. Uh -huh. Things that could not have followed me. Follow me. Things that I could not have been able to explain properly if I see her. So I wrote them and I sent to her. I think I showed the, I, I the letter recently when we were doing the book. It was a funny way of proposing. I said, if you say no again, it doesn't, say, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't spoil anything. It only gives the opportunity to go to God and say, Shibi, I told you. And if you say yes, all right, praise God. You know, then I sent the letter to her. After I now went to see her, I said, have you seen my epistle? And she said, she saw it. I said, so what's my response? She said, I don't have a response for you. Okay, we are going the way of the past three years. I said, so you don't have a response for me? For now or forever? She said, I don't have a response for you for now. I said, okay, so that means there's going to be a response. She said, yes. She said, I will come and meet you in your house in two weeks' time to give you my response. So I was waiting for those two weeks. Those two weeks were the longest two weeks of my life. <laughs> All right. Thank God I married a spiritual wife also. So she went to pray. And when she went to pray, God gave her a revelation. She saw an estate. And somebody was taking her around the estate. And um, it wasn't me taking her around. Follow now. You know, somebody was taking her around the estate. And um, she was asking this large expanse, this big thing. Wow, the person must be great. And that, so she said she was asking the person taking her around, who is the owner of this old thing? She said, you will soon see him. So at the end of the day, she said the car just parked. Then a man came out of the car. He had no limbs. He was white in complexion. And he said, that is the owner of the old thing. And she said right there and then, God said, that is the owner of the old thing. And he needs somebody to help him in managing the estate. And you are the person. Of course, she knew who the person was, that it was me. And then she was comfy. I mean, she was okay. Now, um, I knew why it was difficult for her to say yes. She was considering many things, including the people at home. How would she go and tell them at home that of all like four billion men upon the surface of the earth, it is this one with one leg that she wants to marry. That was her problem. I listen to me, that was her problem. And I think it's a legitimate problem. If it was any of you also, what will cross your mind first? The friendship was not the problem. But how will they accept him at home? But since she has prayed, and God convinced her that go ahead. So she was able to convince them at home. Even though it was not straight like that. Are you listening to me? Now, on my own side also. As I was proposing to all the other sisters also. And to Sister Toy. I knew why everybody was saying no. Not because... Um, I'm not a fine man or fine boy then. I take style, small, fine, small, you know. But when you look up, I'm fine. But when you look to the leg, 
Ha! Ah, if not for this one, the masquerade thing came back. But I've told myself, this leg is not going to defy me. This leg is not going to hinder me in life. So as I proposed, when I first proposed, Antoine said no, and I proposed to the second sister, then I told myself, I said, Kola, they are saying no. Not because they don't like you. Not because you're not brilliant. Not because you are not handsome. But it's because of your leg. So would you give up? Then I told myself, I'm going to be married in life. And I think I deserve the best in life. Then I tell myself, I'm going to get the best of wives. And she's going to be the best of the best. If I propose to a sister and she tells me no, I will say okay. But I will tell myself, she's not my best. If she's my best, she will not say no. Are you with me? And so as I was moving on, and I get the news, naturally I was supposed to be disappointed. Yes, I feel the weight. But I always encourage myself. I say, Kola, no. Don't feel down. She's not the best. If she's the best, your best will say yes. Your best will come and say yes, despite your condition. Are you listening to me? So, when April 9, 1992, when Tony came to my apartment, and then we got talking, she said, if it were other times, I would have still said no. But now I've come to say yes. <laughs> of course, maybe because I've been so accustomed to no. So when she said it, I actually had no. <laughs> then at a point I felt, no, she said yes. And I had to beg her, I said, sorry. Please, what did you just say? Now she was now picking it one by one. She said, if it were other times, I would have said no. But now, I've come to say yes. So two years after, we got married in Abeokuta. And so the three things that God said all came to pass. I'm going to close. You know the story is still long. But let me close this way. And I'm closing with prayer. That every one of you, when it's time for you to settle in life, none of you will marry wrongly in Jesus' name. You're going to marry your bone, the bone of your bone, and the flesh of your flesh in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, I'm saying this because I thought getting married is the start. I mean, it's the ultimate. I never knew the whole journey was just starting. And thank God I married my wife. Thank God I married a spiritual woman. Are you listening to me? I know some of you sisters that said, I want to marry a spiritual brother. So, I said, why? Ah, so you will be teaching me the Bible. No. Get spiritual. Spiritual brothers are always searching for spiritual sisters. 
Are you listening to me? But if you are not spiritual and you are looking for a spiritual brother, it happens, but it's not proper. You just get spiritual. When we got married, naturally you expect the children to start coming. Then the first year, the child was not coming. The second year, and then of course we had to go to hospital. And um, they discovered I was the one that had problems. And um, the more we were treating it, the more it was getting worse. Then the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year, the sixth year. All right. Meanwhile, while we were waiting for the children to come, I told you about my business. Last year, I was cutting many of those things. I was cutting the head like this. But you see, I started a business um, in Abiokuta. It was a commodity business that rubbished me so much. It was doing very well. The money was coming in. Then suddenly, things just took another turn. And the business went under. And I was in heavy debt. Heavily in debt. I had police cases. I had court cases. I think that was like two years after we got married. So two years after we got married, problem came with business. Two years after we got married, we were still waiting for the children. So all the while that we were waiting, the business problem was there. When we got married, and um, I remember the business was doing well, so we moved into a very big house. Very, very big house. It was like a palace. How many more minutes? It was like a palace. But you see, when the problem started, every single fund that we had was gone. So we needed to move. So we had no money to rent any other house. So we had a family friend that we were going to church together that um, persuaded us to move to their boys' quarters. Very small, two-room, the passage can't take two persons, you know. So we moved from palace to boys' quarters. We were both running the business together. So we had only one source of income. This source of income went under. I didn't have money. She didn't have money. We thought the problem was going to be for a while. I told you last week, I tried a lot of other businesses. Abby, I was trying those things, but nothing was working. We didn't have house. We didn't have work. We didn't have a home of our, a house of our own. At a point, we didn't have money. At a point, it was a brethren that would be giving us Gary. And when it is, um, there's one blessed sister, when it is Christmas, she always remember how she will buy new clothes for us. Christmas or, or Easter, she will buy new clothes for us. And um, my wife always does miracle with food. With the gari that is in the house, uh, she will go around and pick um, buri, you know, and then cook it in the water. And so when you put a bind side stew and you remove it, and you'll be seeing to, to, to. And the two of us will look at ourselves and we will laugh. Say, so won't you always be like this? It was recently she told me that most of the time she would have cried in the room. So when I'm saying to always be like this, she always smile. But at times she would still go back in the room and cry. I say, when? She didn't have a child to play with. Nothing she could call her own. 
And then, that's why I said she marry a spiritual woman. Brothers, any time that we had stayed at home and there is no meat, no money for fish, no money for anything, my wife will pray and say, God, they're full of land right now. And then rain will fall. There was a transformer close to the boys' quarters. Suddenly, we will see very big snails. Big snails. They will just begin to crawl out of that transformer. And my wife will begin to pick snails. That's going to be our meat. And as she's doing, she says, thank you, Lord. Thank you for answering my prayers. Thank you, Lord. I thought it was coincidence. The next time she prayed, rain fell. Those things came out again. We were like that for like seven years. The sixth year after we got married, you know, everything was not just working for us. And at the point I called my wife, I said to him, you have tried. You have really, really, really tried. If you go back home now, nobody will say you have not tried. Go back home. Let me face this thing alone. Even child, I cannot give you. You know, in the case of Rachel, she was holding uh, Jacob's um, cloth and said, give me a child. Because Jacob was giving all the other, three other women children, except for Rachel. But my own, I could not give her a child. The go home. And she said, I did not marry you because of when it is good. I married you because it is you. And I know what God told me before I agreed to marry you. Are you listening to me? So the sixth year, Nothing was working. So I just decided to go from Abiyoguta to Lagos. Once in a time, I mean, once in a while, when everything looks so bad, I would just leave Abiyoguta and come to Lagos. Maybe come and sit down with one or two of my brothers and say, at least, just be out of the house. So it was one of those days I was inside a bus from Abiyoguta to Lagos. And suddenly I got so overwhelmed. And I just put my head down and I was crying. I just got fed up. Nothing was happening. No food, no house, no work, no child, no nothing. And I was crying. And then suddenly, Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart. He said, Isaiah chapter 40. Thank God I had the Bible with me in the car that day. I just opened to it. And I was reading from verse 1. He said, comfort you, comfort you, my people. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. Say, say unto her, your hardship is over. And say, for all your troubles, I'll give you double. You know when God said that, I knew God was answering my cries. So I had to just run back home. I think I got to Lagos, took the next bus back to Lagos, to Abiyokuta, to go and tell my wife and say, God said our hardship is over. I said, for all we have gone through is giving us double. I knew it was the issue of the child that God was talking about. So I knew God was ready to give us a child. I said, God said, double. He's giving us twins. God is giving us twins. And, you know, for some of us that talk, one day I was in church, and I was supposed to be the one to minister that day. I didn't know how I was talking until I got to a point and I started saying, brethren, in nine months from now, God has promised to give us twins. You will see our children. 
Of course, that same month my wife took in. And nine months after that time, she delivered. But it was not twins. It was one. And I was saying, So we, we had our first child seven years after our wedding. Of course, his name is, God said, comfort you, comfort you, my people. So his name is Itunolua. You know? And then his second name is Ephraim. You know the meaning of Ephraim? Ephraim means that God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So we're still going through other afflictions. But at least he gave us a child. So we stay fruitful in the midst of all this. So we gave back to it to know he said that boys got us. But we bless God. You know, I think the year it came, 2001, the year it came was when I told you last week that I prayed to God. And he started telling me about Isaiah chapter 41. I'll make you into a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. You, you understand? And so from that point on, I discovered that the hardship started turning. And um, we started this year along the line. The second child did not come. You know, he promised us double. So I discovered that double does not mean twins all the time. Double means two. So the second child, I thought she, he or she was going to come maybe a year or two after it to know Lua. So first year we were waiting, second year, third year, fourth year. I think the fourth or fifth year my wife said, my dear, I need a second child. If God is not going to give us, can we go and adopt? And to me, I took it, not as if adoption is not good, but I took it as a challenge and said, since you cannot do, go and get the one they have done and abandoned. So I said, we are not adopting. God is giving us our own. So I went to intensify my prayers. And as I started praying, each time I pray about the issue of child, I will hear God say, zinc. I say, zinc. Each time I pray, 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 I will hear zinc. And I say, zinc. So I have to go to a chemist to go and find out. Please, is there a drug that has zinc? Ah, they said, there, is a, there are drugs that have zinc. I said, what's the work? They told me the work. So I knew God also knew chemistry. And pharmacy and pharmacy, pharmacology. <laughs> As if he was not the one that created everything. Without going to hospital, I bought zinc. I started taking zinc. And then one day, I was in church like this. I was sitting down. And suddenly, God just came to me and said, That lady at the back. They have been waiting for children also for the fruit of the womb. God said, I have come for her today. Tell her. And so I got up. And you know the way um, that the Jew always say, when he say, there is somebody here, he said, that somebody can be 500. Even though there is somebody, but as many as can their faith to that which God is saying. So that was what I wanted to do that day. So I came out and I said, of course God told me, he gave me the scripture to tell the person, the Shunammite woman. He said, God said, I've seen your work. I've seen what you have been doing. Now I'm going to reward you according to the time of life. By this time next year, I mean, according to time of life, what I said that was that nine months from today, you are coming with your child. So instead of me to tell that person to come, I say, if you know you are the one, come out now. I know the person. I know she's a spiritual person also. I expected that to know that it is God. It was her. God was talking about. But instead of that person coming out, 
my wife jumped out. My wife just jumped out. I said, my dear, it is not you. My dad said, my dear, it is me. <laughs> you know, every head bowed, every eyes closed. So it was just the two of us in front. I said, how can it be you? Not as if I was doubting, but I wanted to be sure. Then she said, do you know that overnight I had a dream? In that dream, God came and he gave a child to somebody in the church. And the person turned to me and said, Sister, to in fe. And I said, I'm in fe. And she gave the child to me in the dream. So it is me. And I understood. That day was August 2, 2007. May 5, 2008. Of course, she got pregnant that same month. That was the sixth year of our waiting for the second child. So the seventh year, May 5, she gave birth to our second child, which was exactly nine days, I mean nine months, um, short three days, that God said he was going to give the child to that person. But the person passed the child on to my wife. But then, it only met our own the second part of the double. Are you listening to me? And our second child's name is what's her name? Ikpinoluakiye. What's the meaning of that in English? When God promises you, it doesn't fail. It may not happen the first year. It may not happen the second year. It may not happen the third year. It may not happen the fourth or fifth or sixth year. But it is God. If he has promised you, it will no lower cooking here. Pastor, I'm stopping at you. Let's rise on our feet. I hope somebody has been blessed. Okay. Unto bati be no lock on re go send it ole da duro eru on loro ba mi eru on loro ba mi o unto bati be no lock on re go send it ole da duro ani eru oloru ba mi eru oloru ba mi o o to ba ti pe nu lo kon re ko se ni to le da duro ko se ni to le da du 